Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, themes, theories, and more. Thank you for joining us for today's episode, where we're covering chapters 19 through 24 of A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mass. But before we dive into this episode, please listen closely to our content warning. While we're focusing our discussion on chapters 19 through 24 and book one as a whole, we are going to bring in themes, foreshadowing lore, and other insights across the entire series. So yes, these episodes are spoiler central for the whole Akatar series. These Akatar deep dives do not, however, have spoilers for the rest of Sarah J. Mass's series. There's no Mass vs. Madness for today's episode. We have way too much to talk about already. We're covering Kalamai, and I will be spending 27,100 minutes on eight words. There you are. I've been looking for you. So if you don't know why we'll be spending 2,700,000 minutes on these eight words, then please respectfully leave. Go finish the book series and then come back. I will not ruin this for you. Next, we of Fantasy Fangirls are adults who say adult things about adult books. In other words, folks, this podcast is rated R. Tamlin bites Feyre in a way that I can only describe as a sexual awakening for me. So please be mindful of little listening ears. And maybe if you're our parents or anyone else in our family, Please just stop here. You do not want to continue listening. Last thing before we jump into our Akatar episode four. If you love fantasy fangirls and you are loving this Akatar journey, if you want more content, more community, more events, discounted merch, early access to ad free episodes and more, please check out our Patreon. We have two membership tiers, the Valkyries for $5 a month and the High Fae for $10 a month. Get more details and join the Patreon party at patreon.com slash fantasy fangirls. The link is also in our show notes or YouTube captions, depending where you're tuning in right now. And now it is time to go celebrate Fire Night and for me to get feral. All right. So as always, Nicole is going to open up this discussion with a summary of what happens in chapters 19 through 24. So gather around, friends. We need an inner circle debrief. Chapter 19. It's date day. Tamlin takes Feyre to this newly spotless gallery in the Spring Court Manor. Feyre has basically an out-of-body experience in front of this magnificent art. After absorbing every brushstroke that she possibly can, Alice leads Feyre to her new painting room filled with the canvas brushes and colorful paints. Feyre's hobby is about to be kicked into high gear montage. Weeks passed and Feyre has come alive in this new chapter of her life. However, intrusive thoughts begin to creep in about her family and the guilt that she bears at the start of every person's therapy journey. One night after dinner, Tamlin follows her into the garden and she opens up to him about what's plaguing her mind. Tamlin comforts her, kisses her wounds from picking up a rose in the garden and promises her answers about the blight when it is safe. The next day, Feyre is walking into the woods when she catches a wild Tamlin. In an attempt to cheer up his human woman, he gives her a sheet of poems, but these are no normal poems. It's smut. Tamlin has written dirty poems using the words from Feyre's trash bin list. And despite how it sounds, it's actually quite charming. Walking back to the manor, Tammy Man tells Feyre about the garden being a mating present between his parents. The word piques her interest though. Mates? Tamlin tells her about mating bonds and how extremely rare they are rare indeed. But large bonfires being built in the distance catches Feyre's attention. Ah yes, Fire Night is coming soon. A very, very holiday that Feyre is definitely not invited to. However, something enters the garden and quickly telling Feyre to hide, Tamlin and Lucian approach this invisible opponent. This hidden from Feyre's sight creature tells Tamlin and Lucian that a certain someone is growing impatient and timid Tam's heart of stone is getting rather filled with fear these days. But with a beat of wings, the invisible Bartok leaves. Chapter 20. It's Fire Night. Okay, breathe, Nicole. Feyre, annoyed, but planning on listening to Tamlin's orders to stay at the house, hears the drums of the celebration, almost beckoning her to join the party. But just as she's about to take a step towards the celebration, a shirtless warrior, Timmy Tam, enters the hallway. So it's a costume party. Tamlin reminds her to go back to her room, and Feyre follows his demand. Well, at least for a little bit. Finally, the extra long drum solo's calling is just too strong. She makes the decision to head head to the celebration. As she approaches and gets a lay of the land, three fairies grab her and start to take her away from the celebration, telling her they just want a little fire night fun. Scum of the earth, these three fairies. But then, then, steady, warm hands grasp her shoulders and with a, there you are, I've been looking for you. These three douche canoe supremes scatter, ready to thank this random stranger savior. Feyre turns around 
to see the most attractive man she's ever seen. Chapter 21, Reese Baby, welcome to the chat. This seeming stranger, however, immediately sets off alarm bells, quote unquote, in Feyre's head. Did she just encounter something much more dangerous? Hey Alexa, play Morally Gray by April J. Thank you. Dismissing this night-kissed muscle man, don't worry, as short as he's on the page, we will be talking about this encounter for the majority of today's episode. Feyre runs off and runs into a pissed Lucian, who immediately takes her back to the house and reprimands her for being a stupid human fool. This is not the nicest thing you've ever said, Lucian. But finally, he at least explains what the hell Calumni is. Tonight, Timitam will let lots of magic into his body. He will kill a stag, seek out a maiden, and through their sweet, sweet bangity bang, bang, banging, spring will reign for another year to come. Yes, this is a very fairy ritual indeed. Leaving with a go back to your room, lock the door, and set up a trap, yikes, Lucian goes back to the celebration for some spring regeneration orgy of his own. Later that night, the drums finally stopped. You took your time, Timmy Tam. And Faber goes downstairs for a midnight snack and runs into a still feral, paint cover, freshly ejaculated Tamlin, who takes this book up to a PG-13, pinning her against the wall, biting her neck, and giving Feyre and a bunch of new-to-the-new-adult-fairy genre readers the sexual awakening of a lifetime. But Tamlin, who was doing really well at seducing his human woman, takes a nosedive with a don't ever disobey me again, receiving a very well-deserved slap in return. Feyre, leaving her midnight snack cookie, stalks off to bed. The next morning, Feyre, wearing her hickey like a boss, walks downstairs where wide-eyed, mad-eyed Lucian wonders where she got that bruise. After some back and forth that ends with Feyre calling them both fairy pigs, Feyre storms off to paint some fairy pigs of her own. Later that night, though, Timmy Tam apologizes with a bouquet of white roses. Damn Tam, way to get your head out of your ass. Chapter 22. Feyre, kicking up her own flirting game, dons a dress for the first time to go to dinner. She walks into the dining room and Lucian, being ever the wingman, yeets. Her and Tamlin have a very intimate dinner, ending with Feyre wanting to show him something and leading him out of the dining room. You can almost hear Tamlin thinking he's getting lucky tonight. But unfortunately for you and your dick, Timmy Tam, Feyre leads him instead into her painting room, showing and offering him a painting of the Pool of Starlight. But he starts to look around and requests instead a painting of her forest where she used to hunt. I guess receiving gifts is not Tamlin's love language. Chapter 23. The next day, again, it's date day where Tamlin and Feyre are lying in the grass together. Tamlin offers to glamour Feyre to show her what he sees as high fae in exchange for a kiss. Feyre agrees, much to Tamlin's surprise. Feyre suddenly sees the world in this whole new way, including a literal glowing Tamlin and a Willow Tree Spotify EP. Feyre upholds her end of the bargain, kissing the back of Tamlin's hand, but then very sleepy. Feyre doses off to sleep. Chapter 24. Waking up back at the manor, Feyre suddenly notices some big differences. Namely, Alice has tree bark for skin, and there's many more fairies around. Who are you people? It's a deep cut SpongeBob reference. Walking into the dining room, sick of me saying that yet, Tamlin notices her unease and explains that he had glamoured her so she wouldn't be able to see the other members of his court. The next morning, there's a head in the garden. That escalated quickly. Lucian remarks how there's a mountain with three stars branded into the head, a gift from the (coughs) major air quotes, sadistic killers of the night court. Shaken though, Tamlin assures Feyre that she is safe with him and they begin talking about a not at all lighter topic in any way, slavery. Feyre assures Tamlin though that he is not like his father in any way and she has never felt like a prisoner in this house. Give it a few hundred pages, Feyre. Yay, Nicole, thank you so much for that inner circle debrief. You know, we hear so much about this food that's being prepped for calamai, but it infuriates me that we never see it because again, Feyre is not invited. Same, I'm dying to know what this food is. Is it yummy or at least is it as yummy as daily harvest? Because achieving our goals is more about making healthy habits and less about quick fixes. It's about having delicious food also. And that's why we love daily harvest. They help you maintain healthy habits and all you have to do is enjoy. They take the planning, the prep, the cleanup out of cooking by delivering my favorite veggie and fruit packed meals straight to my door. Usually keeping healthy habits means the same old boring meals or a whole lot of prep work, but not with Daily Harvest. They've got so many great options for any time of day, which means sticking to healthy habits is a breeze. I personally love their new addition, the veggie pastas, and of course, all of their classic smoothies are just absolutely delicious. Shouts to the chocolate mint smoothie, which is just so 
so good. Create healthy habits that last with Daily Harvest. For a limited time only, go to dailyharvest.com slash FFG to get $30 off your first box plus free shipping. That's dailyharvest.com slash FFG for $30 off your first box and free shipping. dailyharvest.com slash FFG. All right, it's time to step into the cauldron and discuss key insights, foreshadowing theories, and oh, so much more. So before we get into the to just beat by beat of Calamai, we do have a date day between Tamlin and Feyre. And guess what, Lexi? Flower Watch is back in session. So while they're Yay! walking... <laughs> Yay! Thank you. It's later going to be called Plant Watch, but for right now, it's Flower Watch. Feyre and Tamlin are walking to this newly polished gallery, and she smells a rose-scented breeze that comes in from the open windows. Yes, roses, obviously a court of thorns and roses. They're in the spring court, all of that kind of stuff. However, red roses, which are in the garden, which is where that breeze is coming from, symbolizes the beginning of a love story or a beginning of a romantic relationship. And this is technically their first date, if we're not counting the pool of starlight. So I love that little tie-in. I think that's so fun. Now, Tamlin also says while they're in the gallery, quote, it's been a long time since someone appreciated these things. I like seeing them used again. Who do you think he's referring to? Is he referring to someone in his family, an ex-girlfriend? I think he's definitely referring to his mom. She seemed like a very soft person who would have appreciated an art gallery like this. And especially, you know, his father was a very terrible person. And I don't think that he treated her very well, but he still respected their mating bond for whatever that's worth. And I think that there would have been that art gallery specifically for her. Or Tamlin might even be referring to a long, long time ago, even before his father ruled the Supreme Court. But if I had to guess anybody, I would guess it was his mother who this art gallery was either for or who she specifically appreciated. Stay tuned for later this episode when Lexi goes into the possibility of Tamlin's exes, though. <laughs> so very. Oh, I, I went deep. Yeah, I, I love it. It's so good. Now, Tamlin is trying to flirt. We're looking at effort and his level 25 from the pool of starlight is nowhere in sight. <laughs> it is gone. It is died deep in the pond. He's not very good at consistency. Well, <laughs> we, we know that very well about Tamlin. <laughs> Tamlin says, quote, I never knew humans were capable of dot, dot, dot. And then luckily he stops himself. So he has some kind of thought process. But Tamlin. Okay. Uh, Again, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. He did not finish the sentence. That's better. I also think what he meant to say was, wow, you have such an appreciation for what this is. And it, it's, it means so much to you. That's so deep or whatever. He's definitely trying to give her a compliment. So if we're looking at effort, technically, I guess it's okay. But I don't know if I can give him a good grade on this because he does kind of insult her species. <laughs> and it's not the first time and it won't be the last time. And it's not only Tamlin either. Like Reese is also going to be guilty of this too. Yeah. It came off as an ignorant fae who thinks less of humans, which it does. It checks out. I think I've said this in every single episode, but I can't emphasize enough. While Tamlin doesn't think maliciously of humans, he's still got his own major prejudices that are just built in from literally centuries. He didn't ally and fight alongside the humans in the war like Reese and his inner circle did. He wasn't old enough and his family was on the other side of the war. So as far as we know, Tamlin's perspective of humans has been shaped by those enslaved in the spring court when he was young. He was always Always taught that they were less than, didn't feel emotion in the same way, or were stupid, and all those other horrible associations to separate the less than slaves. That was the whole hierarchy in his youth. And even though he disagrees with slavery, some of that is still built into him. I will give Tamlin a tiny bit of credit with how he recognizes Vera needs time to herself in this art gallery. He gives her space to admire it all on her own because he can see how special and emotional this is for her. Good job for not hovering here, Tam. That's really how low the bar That's is right here. That's a really low bar. <laughs> like, yeah. Now, Feyre has these beautiful passing weeks. We get this nice little montage here. I really teared up reading this passage during this deep dive because during this painting montage, Feyre is coming alive and finally shedding that survivor nature that we've discussed. She's painting all day, though. Like, she is... 
she's figuring out what passion is for the first time and not just survival. I am absolutely obsessed with her finding herself in a new way and getting to throw her whole self into doing what she's always wanted. Our girl's creative juices are flowing and I'm here for it. It's the best feeling ever to wake up with so much motivation and excitement and passion to do what you love, to be so fully immersed in it. Like, I know that's how I felt when we first started Fantasy Fangirls. She's also regularly wanting to see and hang out with Tamlin. Like, whatever Timmy Tam is doing, it's working. And also, like, you know the beginning of any relationship where, like, the yes. rose-colored glasses are on. They can do no wrong. Every time they text you, you're like, ooh, you know. <laughs> Not to say that I don't have that with my husband, but this, the newness of it definitely goes away after a while. And that is just such a fun part of life to be in. It really is. Mm -hmm. It is. But she's continuing to have these dreams of death taking a hard left turn. <laughs> This horrible pale woman who keeps on asking for her name or scratching at her throat. This is all the while, though, being watched by, quote, a shadow I can never quite glimpse. This went so over my head on every single reread prior to this deep dive. Reese has been having dreams slash glimpses of Fabra for years. This is her first moment of having him in her dreams while she's not really quite sure it's actually him. In chapter 54 of Mist and Fury, Reese explains that one night he was sleeping next to Amarantha and jolted awake from a dream, a dream that was clearer and brighter than any before. Quote, I was in your dream, watching as you had a nightmare about some woman slitting your throat while you were being chased by the bogey. I couldn't reach you, speak to you, but you were seeing our kind. And I realized that the fog had probably been the wall and that you, you are now in Prithian. Oh, I just get chills. So yes, these are the dreams that finally made him realize that she is in Prithian, but soon she's also going to start dreaming of bonfires. And that's where he finally knows where to find her. And that, friends, is why we love a reread. I love it so much. In this book, Feyre, during this montage about her dream, thinks, quote, I slowly stopped being so afraid. Stay with the High Lord. You will be safe. I love that as she's having these dreams, stay with the High Lord comes up. Where Reese is literally in these dreams as her shadow, but she's not looking back to see him. She's only keeping her eyes ahead on the faceless woman who's trying to kill her. God, the fucking chills! But after weeks of happy painting Feyre, it dawns on her that spring is beginning in the mortal lands and her family still has no idea where she actually is. Quote, Quote, the mortal world, it had moved on without me as if I had never existed. A whisper of a miserable life, gone, unremembered by anyone who might ever known or cared for. Remember that quote from earlier in this book where Nesta says to Feyre, quote, someday you'll have no one left to remember you or to care that you ever existed. And Nesta only says this again because of how much it impacted Feyre the first time she said it. This is Nesta's voice again, living in Feyre's head, haunting her. It is her negative loop that just goes off over and over again during this book. And Feyre, understandably, turns those negative emotions onto Tamlin. He's the one who let her forget them. He's the one who set the glamour on them, making them not worry or care about her departure. He made her not needed. And as much as he did bring her into a new life of wealth and colors and painting, he took any choice from her when it comes to her family. So while they're in the garden, Tamlin gets Feyre to open up about why she's so upset said, and it all comes spilling out. She is hurt that after all of these years, after everything she did for her family, they didn't do anything to stop Tamlin Manbear Pig from taking her away. She gave them everything she had, and they did not budge a flippin' inch. This is horribly sad. This is ultimately why it is so special when she finds her own family within the inner circle. These people would do anything to protect the ones they love, which is why she, at first at least, doesn't feel worthy of belonging in such a group. I know her and Cassian have that conversation in Akabor where he says, you didn't feel like you were essential. She is essential, but it's because of this experience from her past that that inner negative thinking is still there. Yes, exactly. And then back to Tamlin, it's like he doesn't understand why she is metaphorically looking over her shoulder back at her family. He certainly can't relate when it comes to his own family. He lacks the empathy when it comes to those she loves. Yes, they both have had horrible families, but horrible in a very different way. 
Nest is not that bad, right? <laughs> because he can't relate. And yeah, some of those vague prejudices about humans might be there too, like we were talking about earlier. He doesn't comprehend or is only now learning that humans can have complex emotions too. And that's, again, he just doesn't understand why she's metaphorically looking over her shoulder at them. Like It's like, no, just we're happy. We're good. Everything's fine. Feyre's frustrations with Tamlin offer a lot of insight into both their relationship and how Tamlin handles these difficult situations. Like Nicole said specifically in episode two, Tamlin likes to keep his head buried in the sand. He's all about surface level happiness, which goes right back to his inability or unwillingness to tap into his inner emotions, identify the real issue, and what's more, have an open conversation about it. This is one of the big reasons he and Feyre have the same argument in the next book. He's only willing to keep everything surface level. He's doing that here too, acknowledging that Feyre seems upset, but then just saying some words that she wants to hear, he kisses her hand to make it all feel better, and then sends her back to her happy painting. This is interesting. I think we might be having different takes on the scene. I do think that Tamlin gives her the space to open up and talk, and he asks something along the lines of what's wrong and she's able to just word vent back to him and he does start finding a little bit more of a stride when it comes to comforting his human woman Tamlin's checking on his girl he's letting her vent he's not interrupting her which is always nice people <laughs> Nicole <yeah. laughs> there's the way to your heart <laughs> just not interrupting <laughs> I say that as someone who interrupts all the time but he's also not trying to fix everything for her and when finally asked by Pharaoh, why do any of this? He responds with what I do think he was trying to say in the art gallery, quote, because your human joy fascinates me. The way you experience things in your lifespan so wildly and deeply all at once is entrancing. This is much better than the art gallery. It still feels a little bit like he's talking to a species rather than talking to her. But maybe that's just all Tamlin can do at the moment. I don't know. Oh, man, how the tables have turned between us, dear sister, because now it's my turn to have words with Tamlin. And I feel like I've usually been the Tamlin's advocate (laughs) in this podcast so far. So is he trying to express interest in her and compliment her? Yes, but this rubbed me the wrong way right back to their power dynamic that I've been talking a lot about this podcast. It's like the fact that she's human is always front and center for Tamlin. And then remember what the surreal said, his human. We've even been saying it here because that's kind of how it is, right? This is not the first or last time that Tamlin will remind Feyre that she's human. And even though right now he's saying it as a form of endearment, it's still just... I don't know. Again, hindsight is twenty twenty with Tamlin. I liked him too before. I have the text receipts that I've shared on Instagram stories that prove I liked him even though I knew he was a complex character and I thought Reese was creepy. <laughs> Which, by the way, he's also not going to get away with this human slash fey power dynamic when we get to Under the Mountain. Like, he, like nobody's safe from my power dynamic discussions, right? But right here, I... I don't know. I get what you're saying. It is absolutely supposed to be a compliment. But again, it goes back to that human and Faye having that prejudice and thinking that they are better than the humans. I actually 100% see where you're going with this. Like, it makes all the sense in the world. When I first read this scene, I was like, oh, like, how delightful. (laughs) But like I said earlier, it sounds like he's talking to a species rather than talking to a person. Yes. And while he's trying to compliment her, he still has some things to learn, which speaking of which... The next scene, Feyre is walking in the woods and she feels this creeping like sense of someone behind her. But with a snap, she looks up and Timmy Tam is dangling upside down Spider-Man style from her snare. She caught a wild Tamlin, like I said, in the ICD. As she goes up to him to touch his face, remember just two episodes ago, she goes to clean his hand and she's almost afraid to touch him. Like she has to have this moment of courage. Right now here, she just goes like with two hands, she just goes immediately and starts to, you know, caress his face. <laughs> touch his hair shout out to our fourth wing friends (laughs) and my goodness this girl is growing up that that is the nature of this episode she's running her fingers down his hair upside down and he he purrs and quote i wonder how that sound would feel if he were fully pressed up against me skin to skin happy nicole (laughs) beauty is falling in love with the beast But Tamlin, who we have given a very hard time to in this book, and we will continue, especially about his flirting skills, cranks it up past 25 
to a 30. He starts to recite poems to her that he wrote, but oh, these are no ordinary poems. Not only do they get increasingly dirtier, but the second and fourth line in each poem is one of Feyre's words from her trash bin list. Now look, I am not a poetry person. If Brett started reciting poetry, to, I'm not thinking against people who are, that's great for you. If Brett started reciting poetry to me, I would be like, that's great, honey, but what's for dinner tonight? Like, I would not be phased at all. <laughs> Does imitating your kids adorable talking and rhyming their words count as poetry? Because that's what we do. Like we'll be at like a nice dinner that we've been waiting like two months for. And that's what we do at the dinner table, <laughs> at the nice restaurant. <laughs> I'm so glad you found your person. <laughs> I know. But the fact that these are fun, sexy poems, I will happily put aside my aversion to poetry. I'm all game for this. I so desperately want to know what was on that last poem, which is the dirtiest and foulest of them all. But you know what, Tamlin? A plus, 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 plus for effort here. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. But I'm also going to say this all started with him asking her if she's feeling better today. And she gives a noncommittal response. This goes right back to him keeping things surface level and easy. Tamlin's not pressing her or helping her work through everything. Instead, he's kind of just distracting Pharaoh with charm and happiness. And again, like hindsight's 2020. Yes, he has good intentions, though he's like, please don't be sad anymore. Here's some poems to make you feel better without truly working through these core issues that Feyre feels. And it's going to extend into the next book as well. Granted, it seems to work. And she's wrapped up in this High Lord and his poems, which I'm actually going to have some words for her later about all of this. But yes. You know what I'm learning listening to you talk about this is I think in a new relationship, I am Tamlin. (laughs) Like, I do not (laughs) open up to anyone. I do not go past the surface level until like, I think it took Brett and I like two years before I actually fully opened up to him about things. That's so funny because the reason that Jake and I say that our first date was the best date that either of us had and we really realized that this was something was because we were really open with each other and we were both each going through a difficult time separately and then we came together and were able to be transparent and share that and work through everything together even though it was all separate. Oh, I love that for you. I should also know it's not because I don't trust my husband. I trust him deeply. (laughs) It's because I have issues that I'm working through. (laughs) So (laughs) there's that. On the way back to the manor, though, Feyre asks Tamlin about this mating bond that he mentioned the prior night. Tamlin tells her that while most high fae marry, if they are super de duper lucky, they will find their mate, quote, their equal, their match in every way. Neon sign, neon sign, mates are important. And of course, we think on our first read that this is foreshadowing for their eventual mating bond. Because why wouldn't it be? This is a romance novel after all, and there's flowers and poetry and dresses and loving one another, but <laughs> Calamai, we're almost there. I can't wait. Now, as Feyre is asking about Tamlin's parents' mating bond, we get a claw watch. Tamlin starts to talk about his father, specifically not his mother, and his claw Claws peek out of his knuckles, but don't shoot out. <laughs> they don't bitch slap his face like they did the last episode. <laughs> Clearly, Tamlin still has some anger with his father. I am just saying, last episode, we did bring up the idea that Tamlin and Reese's sister were mates. And the more and more I think about it, the more and more I'm super on this train. This would support the idea that Tamlin and Reese's sister, I need a name for her, were mates because of the fact that Tamlin's father is responsible for killing Reese's sister and mother. So maybe the fact that Tamlin's still super harboring some anger towards him might be of this nature. He was also an evil high lord. Just throwing that out there, too. Can there be both? (laughs) Fair point. (laughs) I have a question for Tamlin. He was in his father's war band. What war? The war occurred when he was a child, so he joined his father's war band after this, once when he grew up. To my knowledge, Tamlin hasn't seen or experienced actual war. And Tamlin does say here that the war band was by the border. Which border? The the wall border? Like, I'm assuming that's the border he's talking about. And if he was with his father's war band, isn't that like the bad guys. So am I missing something here? I assume it was armies getting ready for war and not an actual war. Because remember, as much as Feyre calls him a warrior, 
Tamlin actually hasn't been in a war, unlike another High Lord. I don't know why I always assumed it was the 500 years ago war, but he was so young yeah. that he didn't see any. He was just like yeah. hanging out with the war band, but... No, it was once when he started growing up. Yeah. Maybe it was just like a squabble that he's calling a war, but it was just like not really much of anything. And Reese is like, hold my beer. Yeah, I think that's what it is. That's awesome. (laughs) awesome. Like Tamlin has not been in an actual war, even though he was in a war band. No wonder he doesn't know how to do war politics in Mist and Fury and Akawar. That makes so much sense because he's an idiot. But then (laughs) Feyre changes the subject, seeing fairies building unlit fires and asks, what are those? What are those? And Tamlin says they are for Kalamai or Fire Night, which is a spring ceremony that generates magic for the year ahead. And it's very fairy. Very fairy description gets me every time. I understand why Tamlin doesn't tell her about the Great Rite because, yeah, that would be a really awkward thing to admit to the woman you're courting. But she is also a curious human who really wants to be included. So maybe give her some kind of info. Like it doesn't have to be the full download that Lucian ends up giving her, but give her something. I don't know. Where's Alice with her onboarding when you need her? I do think that if he gave her the full download of like, I will be taking a maiden into the cave, she would be there in like the center of the cave. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I do understand him not wanting their first time to be that way. You're You're so so right. <laughs> Wow. Uh, okay. Now, just when you thought we were done with Claw Watch, it is back and it's not the last We're time. never done with we're Claw Watch done. when Tamlin's on the page. <laughs> oh, Miss and Fury is going to be fun. Feyre asks if she's allowed to go to this very fairy holiday. Come take me, sailor style. <laughs> and Tamlin says, no, quote, he clenched and loosened his fingers again and again as if trying to keep the claws contained. I 100% think that this is either sexual frustration or jealousy of this idea of her being with someone else that night because it is just a fairy orgy or maybe the fear that basically what happens to her is like some horrible fairies come to save her and then Reese daddy shows up what are your thoughts why do you think he's trying to keep the claws at bay I took it as his aggressive protection to keep her safe. This, and I will also say, this is one time that I do agree with Tamlin because Feyre, she should not be at Calamai. Like, she just shouldn't be. We later learn that this very fairy ritual involves a cave floor with lots of blankets, but that sounds nowhere near as comfortable as a bed, especially a bed with miracle made sheets. Or nowhere near as clean, because did you know that traditional bed sheets can actually harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat? It can lead to acne, allergies, and stuffy noses. It's just so gross. Miracle Made offers a whole line of self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding such as sheets, pillowcases, and comforters that prevent 99% of bacteria and require three times less laundry. Using silver-infused fabrics inspired by NASA, Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long, so you get better sleep every single night, not just Kalamai. And most importantly, Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands, and they feel just as nice, if not nicer, than some sheets used at five-star hotels. Go to trymiracle.com slash FF to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo FF at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an additional 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash FF and use the code FF to click Claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash FF to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. So Tamlin notices that something's a coming and he's like, I need you to stay hidden. But Feyre's not able to see any danger. We later learn that this is an invisible adder or as I like to call it, invisibar talk. And Feyre thinks that maybe it's shameful for her to not go and help Tamlin with this invisibar talk situation. But she thinks, quote, he is a high lord. I would just get in the way. Not 
Five minutes ago, Tamlin was telling Feyre about mates and how they're equals in every way, and she starts unconsciously thinking of all the way that they're the same. But boom, as Lexi would like to say, that power dynamic is back in session. Things were going a little too well in the spring court, and we needed that tension back in our story with the adder. Let's walk through the code meaning of this conversation, because again, on a reread, there's a whole lot more to it. The adder says, your continued behavior is garnering a lot of interest at court. That was so good! <laughs> Continued behavior in respect to Tamlin fighting all the creatures Amarantha keeps dumping, I assume, or that he's enjoying himself and going off to beautiful places. I- I'm assuming that the continued behavior is more along the lines of how he's fighting all of these creatures that she keeps dumping. I took it the other way. I took it as his continued behavior of burying his head in the sand and not doing anything like it's it's interesting that he's on the last legs of the of the curse and he's not doing anything about it I you know what you're actually right there but he's just kind of twiddling his thumbs sort of thing he's not throwing in the towel yeah (laughs) and then the adder follows up with she has begun wondering why you haven't given up yet and why four naga wound up dead not too long ago because the deadline is so close and it doesn't seem like there's a human to fall in love with Tamlin Amarantha is wondering why he hasn't bowed his head tossed in the towel and come to her I'm personally not sure why anyone is wondering why four naga are dead why wouldn't Tamlin want to kill them for the sake of his court. She also wasn't pleased when she heard Tamlin was dispatching his warriors, aka trying that last effort to find the cure. But hey, nothing came of it. Phew, she doesn't know about our girl Feyre. Then we get another mention of Tamlin's Heart of Stone. Ding, ding, ding. I'd like to point out that it is actually mostly Lucian doing the talking for Tamlin in this stretch here. Quote, he's not like the other fools. And then Lucian says that Tamlin isn't trying to break the terms of the treaty. He's the one who insists that the adder gets out. Lucian even spits it's burn in hell in reply for Tamlin. Again, speaking for him in defense of Tamlin's lands. I know that Lucian is his emissary and, you know, like part of his job is to speak on behalf of Tamlin, but Tamlin's right there. He should be doing this himself. And again, that just shows the kind of high lord that Tamlin is. He should. He should be doing this himself, but who's surprised that he's not? (laughs) The next day, though, Favorite goes to paint and she, still haunted by the day prior, basically paints the adder almost 100% accurately. Now, remember, he was invisible in the garden. How did she do this? I figure the glamour only works so well. It's like it physically works, but mentally she's still able to see it. Damn it, Nicole. All I can think of now at the Adder is the song, In the Dark of the Night. In the Dark of the Night. (laughs) (laughs) We need to rewatch Anastasia. What a fantastic movie. Now all I think about is And I Key Cursor. (laughs) (laughs) Which I will be saying so much under the mountain when he beats her. We need to bring some humor (laughs) into Under the Mountain, (laughs) right? We got to bring some humor in somehow. (laughs) I do have a small theory about how she knows what the adder looks like despite i have a guess about what it's <laughs> what do you think i have a guess what do you think it is? it's her ancient fey lineage yes. <laughs> somewhere in the back of her mind she knows about the adder and what it looks like because of her ancient fey lineage it is a crack theory and i'm dying on that hill i have one foot in that camp too absolutely I'm so oh i've i've thought that the whole time i mean i'm not quite on the same spices train as you are but like i'm along for the ride absolutely <laughs> This is why we're good sisters and good friends. <laughs> Lexi, are you ready? Yes. It is time to go to Calamai. Yay! <laughs> we need to first talk about something that is over the course of this entire stretch of chapters the drums. Throughout this whole stretch of chapters, the drums are growing and growing. And it's this very interesting word that is used to describe them. These words are summoning or even a string tied to my gut pulling me toward the hills. I do wonder if this is not the drums at all calling her to the right. Instead, it's Reese and his presence calling her to go meet him finally. I mean, yeah, like it's not absolutely confirmed in chapter 54. I know we both like really looked at that with a fine tooth comb. So like Nicole said, these descriptions of the drums, it's so interesting. These drums, they're deep and they're probing, like they're pounding her core. (laughs) What did you just say? I just realized what I said. (laughs) 
and they're summoning her. Yeah, they are. <laughs> her shadow is even pulsing to the beat of the drums. There's that shadow language again, priming us for our shadow daddy. I'm sorry. I love it when shadow daddy and pulsing are in the same sentence. Yeah, it was definitely Reese calling to her in, in, in uh, through their mating in their bond. In probing, prodding, <laughs> pounding her core away. Absolutely. Never going to listen to drums the same way again. <laughs> I love how magic is so heavy in the air this night that she can smell it stronger than ever before. Remember that metallic tang, it's, it, it represents magic there for humans there and she can smell it even more than usual. Earlier, I speculated that Tamlin was so nervous, this is when I was doing Claw Watch, about her going to the Great Right and wondering if it was certain different reasons. Here, though, he tells her to lock her doors and set up a snare. This is him telling her not to just not go. This is him telling her, keep him out of her rooms while he's wild with magic. I also want to point out, remember earlier in the book, he says, I may take a beast form, Feyre, but at least I'm civilized. Side eye, Tamlin. Side eye. To be fair, this is a unique situation. Even before he is wild with magic, though, Tamlin, he's so masculine here. He's the warrior we learned about in the previous chapter. He's a hunter. He's primal. He's fierce. He's it's such a stark contrast to Reese, who we meet here soon, who's described as the most beautiful man and sensual and smooth. And it's almost feminine kind of language. Like, Reese is very in touch with his emotions. He, he cries multiple times in this series. There is nothing wrong with guys crying by any means whatsoever. I do not see a scenario where Tamlin would be that in touch with his emotions. He is so, like, in that, in what you're saying here. Whereas Reese does have a little bit more of that masculine and feminine balance to him, and I love it. Feyre is pacing in her chambers, and she's wondering to go or not to go. And, quote, a wild, wicked voice weaving in between the drum beats whispered otherwise. I... I do not think that this is Reese's voice by any means literally, but I do think the wild wicked is very Reese sounding. It's supposed to emulate him, even though it's not him specifically. Absolutely. She's literally trying not to follow her heart and then she fails. Thank God. She In the fails. best way possible here. <laughs> <laughs> Feyre finally decides to go to the bonfires and riding bareback on her white mare. Nice. Feyre comes across a group of high fae that when she looks at them, their faces start to turn blurry. But when she's looking off to the side in her peripheral vision, they are still crisper. I'm not going to say clear, but they're crisper. She realizes that she's been glamored to not be able to see them. Why? Like, I, I'm curious. Is this the same glamour that's on her at the manor? That's my understanding. Yes. I'm pretty sure it's because, yeah, there's already a glamour on all of them. And tonight, if I had to speculate, which obviously that's what we're doing here, tonight she can actually see them versus them be invisible. Maybe it's because of all the pulsing magic in the nice. air. And that's why she can see their shadows and shapes when usually she can't see or hear them at all. I, I do think that because there is that stronger magic in the air, the usual rules of glamour don't quite apply. Apply. And then we do know that the glamour doesn't work on the non-spring court fairies because it clearly doesn't work when the three bad fairies and the most handsome high lord of the night court interact with her. Also, when she's coming across this first group of fairies, she thinks, quote, where did they live if they belong to the spring court but not dwell in the manor? This is showing just how sheltered and I'll say naive, but not to her own dismay. Like this is not her own decision of being this naive. It's because this is the situation she's been in that she's she's been since moving to Prithian. She does not realize that people even live outside the manor despite looking at the map and seeing how vast these courts are. She does think in Mist and Fury after seeing Valaris for the first time that quote, I just have been a fool in love to allow myself to be shown so little of the spring court. This is when her and Reese are doing their thought for a thought moment. This is her not even knowing that she's being shown so little. And it's so sad to see that, again, that innocence, but it's not a diss of Feyre by any mean, but that innocence on display here. Being the lore nerd that I am, I do get a little bit frustrated about how little we learn about the Spring Court, given how much time we spend here. But of course, like you were just saying, it makes sense. We're in Feyre's POV and she is purposefully sheltered even after the threat of Amarantha. All we get is a large village nearby and then all the fairies at the Tithe. Then the inhabitants of the Spring Court seem to ditch the territory when everything collapses on Tamlin and Akawar. Where 
where do they go? We don't know. But I'm very curious about the Supreme Court population throughout this series. Because there's obviously plenty of other people and we just never really see much. I plant watch is back. <laughs> so Feyre <laughs> ties up her horse to a sycamore tree. Sycamores are a symbol in Celtic fairy tale folklore for enlightenment and for connecting the heaven and the underworld. I love this because enlightenment, obviously with, you know, being enlightened with seeing your mate and all this kind of stuff, but the heaven and the underworld. It feels so like she's here in this, you know, peaceful spring court. Obviously, Akatar is much more like, ah, oh, sunshines, butterflies, and roses. The underworld is the court of nightmares. It is the darkness that we're about to meet within Reese. And I just, ah, wow, SJM, wow. Even if this was totally not purposeful, I don't care. It is so cool. I was just going to say, it doesn't matter what the tree meaning was, we would have found meaning yes. out of it. I'm just going to throw that say, out there. There is <laughs> one tree mentioned later that I looked it up and I could not find a tie-in. And I'm like, I think it was the crap apple tree that's in like chapter 24 or something. And I'm like, I cannot find a tie-in. So there there is also <laughs> plants in here that do not have double meanings. So, Feyre. Oh my god, I'm so excited. I'm sweating right now. Feyre is grasped by these three fairy strangers with cruel pitch black depthless eyes. They are not wearing masks and their features are sharp. So that means they're not from the spring court. But then it begs the question, where do you think they're from? Because these guys are assholes. That's a good question. Well, we know that all the other courts are under the mountain. And while they could have come out that night from under the mountain, I think that they are some of Amarantha's lowly cronies. And she has so many that she doesn't even realize that they're hers. Because when Reese does make them lie and claim that they hate her later on, which we learn about in chapter 54, if they're lying when they say that they hate Amarantha, then I'm going to assume that they're probably hers. So I think that they come from under the mountain or ultimately from Highburn, but they are under Amarantha. That totally makes sense. That totally checks out, which we do learn that Reese does make these fairies fucking pay for what they do. And I'm gonna, I, I do not condone violence. I need to say that. I'm not mad about what Reese Ann did, though. That's all I'll say. <laughs> These horrid three fairies are pulling her into the woods when one shoves her down and Feyre is about to grab for her knives when warm, strong, and broad hands grasp her under her shoulders and pull her upright to make her standing again. And we hear, quote, there you are. I've been looking for you. And it's said in a deep, sensual male voice she's never heard before. And the phantom goes wild. Hello, Rhysand. We've been looking for you too, my guy. I don't care how many times I read or hear his opening words. I get chills. Chills. Only on a second reread, though. I did not get chills the first time. But afterward, oh, my God, it just chills all up and down my body. My body. My. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing what we know now from Akamath's chapter 54, Reese was here at Kalamai to find this person he's been dreaming about. He told Amarantha that he wanted to go to the spring court for the celebration to spy on Tamlin and to see if anyone showed up wishing to conspire with Tamlin. Reese played on her paranoia because the curse deadline was so close and Amarantha was getting a little bit nervous. When Reese arrived, Arrived at Kalamai, he could smell Feyre, and he tracked her, leading up to this big moment of finding this human girl. And the reason he could smell her is because when he would wake up after being in her dreams, her scent was literally in his nose, which, ah, it's so cute. There's so much in these short, short, short two paragraphs that I just want to pull out real quick. First things first, I love that his hands are described as warm. She's going to very quickly be like, I think this guy's a monster. This is not a good situation to be in. But her first impression is warmth. This is something we do associate with Resand after obviously reading Akamaf. Second, deep, sensual male voice, sensual indeed. And of course, third, this line, you say these eight words, there you are, I've been looking for you to anyone who has read these books and you make an instant best friend. They have become a rallying cry for this story. But what a masterful move from SJM. You don't realize the weight of these words until hundreds and hundreds of pages from now. Here, it seems like just anything you'd say to someone to pretend to know them and get them out of a bad situation. I know that I was once at a bar, I was getting hit on and I really was not feeling it. This total stranger saw my discomfort, comes up to me, says these exact words, there you are, I've been looking for you, and pulled me out of that situation. Like This is such a relatable moment. 
And if you listen to one of our AMA episodes, you'll know I actually had almost this exact same thing happen with Ryan Gosling years and years and years ago, like right down to slipping a casual arm around my shoulder and leading me away from the creepers. I said relatable moment. Like, <laughs> 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 all of us have we sand moments with Ryan Gosling. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> the casualness of these eight words don't elicit anything to question or any intent for us to have as a fandom on our first read. But then in chapter 54, we realize that after having these dreams of this girl for three years, after waking up with her scent in his nose, after seeing her dreams of these hills readying for fire night, he has been looking for her all along. Chills, 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 chills. The irony of all of this is that when Rhysand says this to her, she's not even looking at him. <laughs> she is keeping her eyes fixed on the danger ahead. This sounds familiar because in her dreams of the Naga, the bogey, and this faceless red-haired woman, she feels the shadow behind her watching her, but she keeps her eyes on the danger in front of her, refusing to look back and inspect the shadow. That's what's happening right here in front of her. Obviously not with a faceless red hair woman, Naga or Bogey. Instead, it's with another threat, which is horrible. But the fact that she doesn't even turn around to look and seeing that as a parallel in the story is just so beautiful. Rhysand goes to slip an arm around Feyre's shoulders. These three fairies look in absolute horror at the high lord of the night court. Rhysand goes on to say, thank you for finding her for me. While he admits in chapter 54 that he was tracking her scent through the celebration, it was getting it dragged away by these piece of shit douchebags. That is what caught his eye. And he just, quote, moved and didn't even know what he was saying when he was saving her, which is perfection. In fact, the fact that Reese is this smooth when he's rattled, like, of course he is. <laughs> so annoying. I would be like, um, excuse me, sir. So can you please look? Once these three horrid fairies leave, Feyre steps out of Reese's arms, and she notably in her inner monologue describes him as her savior right here from the get-go. Earlier in the book, when Feyre first came to the spring court, she was caught between thinking of Tamlin as her captor and savior. She leans far more into captor because that truly is how it feels at first. Even though Tamlin thinks of himself as her savior, it takes her a long time to warm up to that way of thinking too. However, right here, Reese is her savior from the first moment from the get-go. He saved her from a very real threat while Tamlin pulled her away, yes, from poverty, but also from her family. It further establishes this stark difference between the two high lords and sets up who the real savior is and who indeed is the real captor. And then, quote, standing before me was the most beautiful man I'd ever seen. Yeah, he is. Personally, when I read this for the first time, I was like, oh my God, are we about to start a love triangle? Like, that's exactly where my mind was going. Well, and right after I finished Akatar, I texted you asking, oh my God, is this going to become a love triangle? Because I was not having it. And you assured me it wasn't. And I was like... <laughs> Okay, I don't see how not, but I'll go along for the ride. I'll believe you. Remember when I said earlier about how Tamlin appears tonight? Super masculine, the ultimate warrior and provider, the hunter. And in contrast, Reese is described as the most beautiful man Feyre has ever seen. He's sensual, he's warm, he's smooth, he's polished, not rugged like Tamlin, even though he is ultimately the real warrior and provider for his people. Now, Akatar was my first romanticy book, like it was for so many of us. And when I read the scene, introducing Reese, I did not at all put two and two together. I thought his beauty actually played into his evilness, like how the three lesser fairies were. Like the more beautiful you are, the more evil you are. I know better now. The moment the MMC and future love interest is introduced, I can spot it a mile away now because I learned my lesson the hard way with Resand. <laughs> Let's keep talking about the Resand description, though. We're not done. Never, oh, well, I'll never be done. <laughs> he radiates sensual grace and ease. His hair is black and, quote, gleamed like a raven's feather. What's on the cover of Akamaf? Yep. It's a raven holding a ring, but we're not there yet. He has deep blue eyes, so deep and blue that they practically look violet. And then he's also notably got pale skin, which we'll later learn is because he's been under the mountain for so long. So sad. And night seems to press closer in around him. Hi, Lord of the Night Court. He has officially entered the chat. As much as we pull out the foreshadowing for their mating bond and her draw to him, it is also important to note the warning bell language we equally get here from Feyre's POV. Because if we didn't get narration like, quote, made me want to run in the other direction, it would be 
I'll say a little too obvious. And we can't forget, Reese is a morally gray shadow daddy who just terrified these three lesser fairies. If Pharaoh wasn't unnerved by him, our eyebrows would raise even higher than some of ours already did. Not mine. Like I said, I thought he was evil for a while, but I know lots of people first read this and were like, oh, the plot thickens. And then these two start to have their very first conversation. And yes, we're going through it line by line. Reese asks why a mortal woman is out on fire night. I also want to just shout again to Jennifer E. Ketta, who does such a good job with Resand and making him very playful sounding. And I just think she does such a marvelous job. Faber's inner monologue says, quote, his voice was like a lover's purr that sent shivers through me, caressing every muscle and bone and nerve. All of this wording and foreshadowing to their mating bond. Remember, Tamlin said earlier about mating bonds and mentioned how deep they run. How about every muscle, every bone, and every nerve? That sounds pretty deep to me. This is also a little bit reminiscent of the description we got only pages ago about the drums that were calling to her. Don't forget, they were pounding deep into her core. (laughs) As favorite answers that her friends brought her, in her inner monologue, she says, the drumming was increasing in tempo, building to a climax I didn't understand. Well, yes, the climax here seems like the great ride and Tamlin choosing the maiden and whatever, but the climax, which is perfect wording, SJM, in our greater story is this. It's her meeting and talking to her mate without even knowing it. I also love that she says, this climax that I don't understand, that you don't don't, Feyre, you don't understand, not yet. She notices how magnificent his body is, like she likes to say, is with his clothes cut so closely to it, quote, as if he's been molded from the night itself. Again, using that night language and beauty interchangeably. Ah, I love it. Now, I love that SJM throws us for quite a bit of a loop here. Again, like Lexi said, if we had just like, oh, he's beautiful, he's handsome, he's my savior, this would be like, Okay, so I guess this is the new love interest now. We have to have these questions thrown in here as well. Faber wonders if she just traded these horrid fairies for something far worse. There's language about how he smiles like a predator sizing up his prey. This has to be here. We have to believe that he is capable of such horrid things, especially where he goes for the rest of the story, because Reese is going to take some L's. Pretty oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and then there's that language, that prey language. Who else treats Farah like prey in the stretch of chapters? Tamlin. And also, she knows that she's a human. She knows that she is meek and weaker than these fairies. And this is also her calling herself prey. And he's the predator because she just kind of knows that's how the, di- again, the power dynamic is. When we read chapter 54 and understand Reese's POV from the scene, he reflects that he realizes that Farah has no idea who he is in this moment. He has been seeing her dreams, but she hasn't seen his. So he's not actually looking at her like a predator sizing at prey. He's looking at her intently to see if she recognizes him too. When we were preparing for this, I had her POV chapter and then I had chapter 54 and just kind of going line by line with the comparisons. And it's just so cool to see this on full display on the reread. Oh, it makes me so happy. Faber mentions Therese how she's here with two lady fairies who she's known her whole life. This line really stood out to me on the deep dive. I'm, you know, I'm on such a hyperactive Archeron family lineage watch and I am pretty much convinced, like I've mentioned earlier, that the Artron family are descendants from who the bone carver in Aka War mentions this like distant high fae lineage that still runs through a human line. So it's interesting that Feyre says that she's here with two fairy ladies that she's known her whole life. This feels to me like a classic SJM planting the seed for us to learn about the true lineage two fairy ladies who she's known her whole life. Who are some other ladies who are two of them who she's known her whole life? Her sisters. Knowing that she is lying in this moment, to be clear. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Knowing that she's obviously lying in this moment. But there could be so many hints right here to her family lineage, even though, yes, she is lying. But just like dreams, how they have so many different meanings. This could have some meanings as well. 
I like how Reese even inquires why she isn't on her side of the wall. He's obviously curious here on the page, but we later get the additional context that he realized she crossed into Perithian because the fog from the magic of the separating wall lifted. So there's a much deeper meaning to his curiosity here about like, why are you here? Please tell me. <laughs> Reese smiles at Feyre, catching her in her lie. And she thinks, quote, I had never seen anyone so handsome. I never had so many warning bells peeled in my head because of it. I I love this line because I don't think that those are warning bells at all all. I think that she has been led to believe through her fear of fairies that this one is especially particularly scary. So she thinks that these bells going off in her head are warning bells. I think those are mate bells, though. Going to the chapel, chapel and they're gonna, gonna get, get married. married. <laughs> but in this moment, Reese is also blocking her escape route and circling her, which if I was in Feyre's position, yeah, I'd be terrified as well. No matter how beautiful this high fae is or how harmful unless he ultimately ends up being to Feyre, any woman would feel this way. Like, again, it's just the power of the POV and it's just incredible. It's so true. Reese tells her to enjoy the right and stay out of trouble. And Feyre thinks, quote, his eyes gleamed in a way that suggested staying out of trouble meant staying far, far away from him. In chapter 54, Reese, I love how we just say chapter 54 and everyone in the fandom knows exactly what book and where <laughs> we are in that book. In chapter 54, Reese explains that he knew that someone could see them together and report back to Amarantha if he stayed talking to her too long. And if that happened, Amarantha would find her and do unspeakable things to her. The way his eyes are gleamed here is exactly what he wants her to do. He wants her to stay away from him to keep her safe. So he begins to walk away from her and we learn in chapter 54 that he thinks she's glad to get rid of him or maybe even thinking that the cauldron blessed him this gift of just seeing her once. Like that's all he's worth is just seeing this like peaceful being this this lovely being just once it's so sad but. well because he knew in that moment he's like i think i knew even then mm -hmm. so it's him feeling blessed and gifted that he was able to see his mate even though he's not outwardly thinking this in this moment but he kind of like uh, subconsciously knows that he is able to see her just once oh but whether she knows it or not, Feyre cannot let go of him just yet. And Reese knows that too. She calls after him in a way that, quote, might be her biggest risk yet. I love how she instinctively knows to hold her ground when he gives her that lazy smile as he radiates with lethal power. Yes, she admits to herself that she's terrified of him in this moment, but she also doesn't balk from him. And in this entire series, Feyre never cowers to that lethal power that radiates off of him. And it's one of the reasons that, that their bond is so strong is because she understands that power and she sees beyond it. I see you, Reese. I see all of you. And it does not scare me. Oh, and she also learns that he's not part of the noble spring court. So she asks him, why are you here then? What a loaded question, Feyre. But just to ensure that she will stay far, far away from him, thus keeping her safe, he answers, quote, because all the monsters have been let out of their cages tonight. Reese does also see himself as a monster in many, many ways. This is so self-deprecating. Humor is a stretch word here, but it's laced with so much sadness. Huh, it's a good thing we've never said that about Feyre on this podcast before. He gives her such a layered, honest answer here. That's both true on the surface because, yes, some of the monsters have been let out of their cages for this night, once again making us wonder where these bad fairies are coming from. But it's also that honest reflection of himself, not in a vulnerable way, but in an ironic way, like you said, Nicole, that self-deprecating humor. And then he leaves. That's it. But don't worry, Reese. We'll see you soon. Next episode. Thank God. I miss him already. Now we have to go back to swooning over man bear pig. I'm like Rose from Titanic. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come back. We will see our sweet, sweet Rhysand soon enough. And before you know it, he'll be buying Amran jewelry. He'll be talking to Farah about you know, certain stores that they're going to visit. And we're getting ahead of ourselves. I got way too excited. I do wonder if Valara stores have any point of sale systems that they can trust. Well, I really hope that they're using Shopify. Shopify POS is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale 
across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers inline and online. Shopify helps you drive in-store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash FFG, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash FFG to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash FFG. So Reese, my darling, might be gone, but we're not done with males being in Feyre's life. Feyre escapes this savior, most beautiful monster man, and heads back to the crowd, only to come eye to eye with Lucian, who then winnows, we learn it's winnowing in book two, right in front of her. Then he slings her over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes and runs back to the manor. All the grace and elegance of her encounter with this lethal night fae is gone, and Lucian's splashing cold water on us all with descriptions like sack of potatoes, which that phrase is actually an inside joke with my husband Jake and I, so I laugh extra hard at it. (laughs) But then we finally get some answers about this great Right. We learned that it is the official start of spring in Prithian and in the mortal worlds, and the crops here in the spring court depend on the magic regenerated on Calamai. Okay, this all sounds innocent enough. It checks out. Lucian says that each of the seven High Lords of Prithian performs this every year since their magic comes from the earth and returns to it in the end. It's always a give and take. Pause. This particular great rite doesn't actually happen with all the seven high lords, though. And there's been some confusion among the fandom with Lucian saying this. So let's be clear. This exact rite at Calamai is specific to the spring court. So the best we can infer is that each court has their own version of the great rite where magic flows through the high lord and gives back to the land he's connected to. The land, the court, the cauldron, whatever divine entity chooses the high lord, their magic, it's intertwined with their lands in a very unique way way. The Great Rite, to my understanding, doesn't have to be on Calamai, which is a Perithian-wide celebration, but it is extra special for the Spring Court because it also includes the Great Rite. So I assume a unique Great Rite occurs every year for each of the courts at different times of the year that best represent that court with different magical rituals that don't all include this. I'm not. I'm just saying that every every Great Rite does not necessarily mean it is this specific kind of Great Rite. Not all High Lords have or (laughs) to our knowledge i don't know about helium (laughs) now i do wonder though because it would make the most sense for the night court great right of sorts to be on winter solstice which is not a but is it Starfall? Is Starfall? Star, it would be on Starfall yes because that is night courts winter solstice is the winter courts Oh, duh. That makes sense. I figured since it was the longest night of the year, that would make sense. But winter. that's why it's extra special. Yeah, it's extra special in the night court because it is the longest night. But it is like the big celebration in the winter court. Yep. But tonight on Calamai, Timmy Tam, this is where we learn that this is not just for regenerating magic. Timmy Tam lets a great amount of magic into his body where it will seize control of his mind, body and soul, turning him into the hunter. Ah, that explains the shirtless man with a bow and arrow earlier, but he's going out hunting. All right. He kills a white stag as a sacrificial offering, and then he goes looking for the maiden, which they will then bang, bang, bangity bang, 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 bangity bang. And as a result of this banging magic, it will spread into the earth and regenerate life for a full year to come. <laughs> to come. Nice. <laughs> the sex am, puns are strong in this one. <laughs> four. <laughs> they have sex for the first time next episode. Watch me be unstoppable. <laughs> but Timmy Tam's not the only one who's getting some tonight. All of the other fairies are allowed to mingle after he makes his maiden choice. And they collect collectively bang to help the magic of the land. Now, we don't know if that's collectively as a unit or like they go off into their own individual little spots of the forest or maybe a little mix of both. But this is very No judgment. Indeed. No judgment. <laughs> Whatever floats your boat. 
So all of the very fairy stuff aside, Akatar's Kalamai has quite a few parallels with a real Welsh holiday, Kalamai, two words, and another one, Beltane, a Gaelic May Day festival. Both holidays are on May 1st and represent ringing in the summer. They traditionally include festivals with bonfires and celebrations, and Beltane in particular historically encouraged fertility with its rituals. Fertility, indeed. It's really cool to see the real world inspiration for this. Now, I do have a question. We know that all the other fairies get to, after Tamlin has made his choice, get to, you know, enjoy the right, so to say. But when do they get to go and enjoy the right? Is it right after Tamlin has made his choice? Or do they all have to watch and <laughs> then afterward go out? I don't know if like, it's watch, but they might have to wait. Like, I don't know. I do wonder if, like, the like bell for like you're good to go is like timmy tam nutting <laughs> and they're good to like go because one of the fuck face fairies earlier says once the rite is performed we'll have some fun so i actually do think they have to wait around for a minute maybe that's why all the food's out they need to like have some like, some nice hors d'oeuvres while they're waiting well all i'll say is it's a good thing he didn't have Feyre then because he would have taken it nice and slow and everyone else would have been like oh my god hurry up i'm getting blue balls here <laughs> they're like looking at their watch they're like jesus christ <laughs> No wonder tonight's not for love making. You gotta get in, you out. <laughs> this is a conveyor. It's a quickie. It's a quickie. Quickie. We are not <laughs> mature enough to be analyzing this. <laughs> but then when Lucian mentions how he's glad he found Pharaoh when he did, because he's already worried that Tamlin's going to smell her and he would have been like, you know, if she was there, he would have brought her into the cave. And Pharaoh's like, and that would have been terrible because <laughs> it's again back to the surreal like you think he likes me <laughs> i don't i still don't think it was like I that 100 <laughs> think it was like that he mentions how timid tam wouldn't want to have it this way tonight's like lexi said not for love making they was like yeah magic tamlin would be bad but quote hearing that that some feral part of him wanted me. I'm turning feral right now. <laughs> so all jokes aside, <laughs> I can't keep a straight face right now. Farah has obviously banged before. Let's not forget Isaac and their tumbles in the... We can never forget Isaac. <laughs> never forget Isaac. <laughs> Average sex lover extraordinaire. <laughs> But it was never lovemaking. So Feyre has never made love. She doesn't have anything to compare against that hungry, raw need for another person. So yeah, I'm not surprised. She's like, wait, wait, wait. I, I am interested. Hold on here, folks. <laughs> Once again, they, meaning Lucian and Tamlin, are taking her choice away from her. Maybe she wanted to be in that cave with him. Now, again, in this instance, I am going to respect Tamlin's choice of not wanting to engage in the Great Rite with Feyre because, you know, he it, it takes due to tango and he is like, no, I do not want to do this in this instance and we have to respect that. But I'm just saying, it's always about what Tamlin wants and shielding Feyre. And, and I will also say that she, I, I stick to my guns where she should not have been at Calibai. No. <laughs> Again, if everyone has to watch, imagine your first time. With I don't the guy. think they have to watch because it's, it's in the it's in the it's in the cave. I think they're like watching around the cave with their hors d'oeuvres and their drinks because they have to wait until Tamlin does his you know whatever. <laughs> oh man, this is gonna be so interesting. When and if the show ever comes out, and then we'll finally maybe get our answers. <laughs> I think they'll probably change it so that we don't get that sheer awkwardness. Oh, I I hope it's there. <laughs> We have to like Tamlin in season one. All of us fans will have to pretend for people who have never read the book series. That'll be a oh hard Oh, God. Hard that's going to be a oh man. hard experience. <laughs> I need to stop. Feyre wakes up the moment the drums and the chorus of bang, 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 bang stop. Annoyed at the fact that she's been laying in bed all jealous, though, she gets up and goes for a midnight snack of a half a loaf of bread an apple, a lemon tart, and she starts nibbling on a cookie. If I had this as a midnight snack, I would never sleep again. I may or may not keep a box of Girl Scout cookies at my bedside drawer. That's what I keep in my bedside drawer. Is <laughs> I even that opened was, up a new box last night. I was going to say, is that the box that was also in your bathroom? Because there was a box of Girl Scout It was actually that same box because my children found it. 
I, I just have to say, I am shaking my head at Feyre because while I get being hungry, she did not have dinner. I get it. If Lucian had been that freaked out by my presence and I'd been told repeatedly with a lot of insistence that I need to stay in my room, keep the door locked no matter what until morning. And when I did already go out when I wasn't supposed to, really horrible things almost happened. I'm just saying I would listen. That, that's all. I would I listen. I would have raided the kitchen first and then had my feast. There is nothing better than eating in bed. I will die on that hill. Nothing better. I no, that's why I keep cookies first. next to my bed. <laughs> <laughs> I would have raided the kitchen first and then gone to my room. I do agree with you. But Feyre is walking the hall, nom on a cookie, and someone steps into her path. Something else for you to nom on, Feyre. I will never never forget reading this for the first time. Remember, I had come from only reading young adult before. You know what doesn't happen in young adult? At least the ones I read, this. When he pins her to the wall and says, I smelled you, I'm pretty sure my soul left my body that day and in its place was the creature you've been hearing before you. <laughs> I was walking, I was actually walking in my hall, like in, in my apartment. I stopped, my jaw fell open. And when Brett looked at me and he's like, hey, what's wrong? I was like, shush, I like got so mad at him for talking during this part. Now, we do have to have a claw watch because as Feyre is pinned against the wall, she realizes that this is not the Tamlin she knows. She says, let go, which is not great that Tamlin did not listen to her requesting that. And his claws, instead of letting her go, punch out and embed into the wall. I do wonder, is this frustration? Is it anger? And I, I don't think it is. This to me feels primal. He goes on to say, you drove me mad. This is in her inner monologue. The sound trembled down my neck along my breasts until they ached. I searched for you and you weren't there. And when I didn't find you, it made me pick another. That it word is very interesting. It made me pick another. Like it's not him controlling his body. It's this different thing. So I do think that he's mad in the literal sense, driven mad by desire for her, hence claw watch. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Now throughout this podcast, we have given Tamlin a lot of dating advice and we have been rating him on effort and homeboy you know he was at a 25 at the pool of starlight he ramped it up a little bit earlier in this episode to a 30 he has skyrocketed to a solid 99 here and not in a good way at least from my perspective we have very different thoughts we on this very scene. Different thoughts there. <laughs> it's it's a something quote <laughs> I would have been gentle with you, though. I would have had you moaning my name through it all, and I would have taken a very, very long time, Feyre. This is actually where my soul left my body. <laughs> you could cut this sexual attention with a knife. Oh, my goodness. But then Feyre does go on to say, I love sassy Feyre. She says, why would I want someone's leftovers? Damn, girl. I appreciate her trying to take some control over the situation in this conversation. She initially had control when she made the decision to leave for a midnight snack and not listen to them. She was taking control back. And then he took that control away from her again by like pinning her against the wall. And she's like trying to like push back on him here and get back her control. I do agree. I definitely agree. And Tamlin, how does he respond to this? He bites her neck, not to pierce it though, vampire style, but instead to pin her to the wall. He does this intently, territorially, and lazily. Those are three very specific words there. Because obviously, you know, biting her is the right response to that, right? I wouldn't be but mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This no. is another really great, this is a perfect opportunity to say this is another really great scene with different meanings from first yeah. read to reread. On the first read, you're already falling for Tamlin too, so you focus on Thera's obvious desire for him, and it's like, ooh, this is hot and manly, and we see this new feral side of Tamlin that intrigues us and makes us feel all the feels, and Thera's like, like, ooh. And then on your reread, you recognize the red flag romanticization. I don't know if that's a word, but romanticization of the beast. I'm going back to my beauty and the beast similarities here. All of his descriptions are aligned with that beast form, even though he's not in his actual beast form right now. Growls, prowling, all that language to give us this perspective that he's inwardly a beast right now, that the magic is controlling him more. He's brute and all of that. This is traditionally represented as sexy. Tamlin's taking charge and ooh, 
ooh la la, and ooh, sexual awakenings, which is totally fine. But then you are able to recognize the sense of control he needs to have and take back from her, like I was saying a few moments ago. Feyre talked to him about someone else's leftovers, and he puts her in her place, literally, physically. And what does he do when she shows signs of liking it with that moan? He pushes away. Why Tamlin? Was she not supposed to enjoy that? Like, and I do think that it was because like he knew that things were going to escalate soon and he did not want that in that particular moment. But SJM is great at showcasing what is traditionally represented as romantic with that masculine dominance and then turns it on its head to make us be like, oh, wait a second. I mean, you're hitting all the points on the head absolutely like i'm going feral over here you're right like you're a hundred percent right and and i'm not trying to splash cold water it's simply the two separate perspectives again mostly on that first read versus that reread and that is why not necessarily this book but this series works so well and it is so intriguing to its huge fandom yes absolutely but then tamlin's 99 takes an absolute nosedive because he says don't ever disobey me again don't just quit while you're ahead my guy like she's getting all hot and bothered and you really fucked it up there you really fucked it up (laughs) it's just it's his need for control it's all over these pages it really is yep so Feyre slaps him and honestly fucking deserved it's so good because if she wasn't going to slap him I would have reached through those pages and done it myself what bam (laughs) Still angry, though, she thinks about how she wants him everywhere. And Tamlin's nostrils flare as if he scents her. Something we don't get a whole lot while Feyre is in her human form, at least, is how when you're turned on, the Fae can smell the change in scent. I love this. Like, SJM really writes romance in a very primal way. I think that that is just such a cool fun weird thing that at least i'd never read before and so right now that's exactly what tamlin is doing he is smelling the shift in her scent but he does let her go which should not be something that's a winning point (laughs) tamlin but the next morning guess where she's off to let me guess the dining room the dining room of course Feyre wakes up with a bruise on her neck not a hickey not a mark a bruise. I do think it's very notable that she chose that exact language. Pharaoh wakes up and she's like, I see this thing on my neck. Uh, She tries to hide it at first, but then she's like, you know what? Fuck no. I'm going to let it fly. She opens up her collar more. She tucks her hair behind her back. I love that Pharaoh is not wanting to back down or play small here. She is like, no, fuck you. I'm going to wear this mark like a champ he marked her tamlin is taking ownership over her i I don't think that feyre sees it like this rather that he was acting like a brute because of the magic and this will just make him feel bad and then just when i thought i couldn't love lucian more feyre walks into the dining room lucian sees the bruise and asks what is that and when she literally points to tamlin with her fork lucian asks him why does Feyre have a bruise on her neck from you? But Tamlin, who again was at an, a 99 last night, back down to his plummeting number of, I'd even go negatives here. This is not a good look, my guy. He admits to biting her. And then he says, quote, if Feyre can't be bothered to listen to orders, then I can't be held accountable for consequences. Tamlin. Oh dear. No, no, that's no, 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 that's not okay. Not good. I have no words. Tamlin isn't taking responsibility for his actions. Who could have ever foreseen this? Oh my goodness. He is victim blaming, plain and simple. This is a massive L for Tamlin here. Massive L. What's full stop? What's lower than an L? This is a. This is oh, bad. God, this is yeah. This is bad. This, this is really is bad. bad. We need to come up with something bigger than a massive L because this is not the first massive L that Tamlin is going to take. I have so many things that I could say here. But I'll be honest, none of it is new from what we've already said on this podcast or what we will be talking a lot about, especially in the early chapters of Akamath. So I'm going to hold back for right now because I think that this just speaks for itself. And I may believe that Feyre should have listened and stayed in her room. But come on, Tamlin, you bit her. Stop gaslighting her. Ah, 
quick claw watch because his claws do stay retracted but push against his skin above his knuckles. Favor even remarks about how his anger is being kept on a tight leash and she's kind of surprised. That's really sad that she says that very casually in her head. This is surprising to me about how ta- uh, how calm Tamlin is here, especially given that he is mad that she disobeyed him, which ugh. after she screams fairy pig, though, he's smiling. So is he that mad at her or is he also kind of like, I win? I think that he's treating this like a game. Was he mad that she left her room? Of course, she disobeyed him. He's mad about that. And there could have been some really bad consequences. But Tamlin also might have realized just how much she wants him from that midnight encounter. And from her reaction this morning, that's kind of where it becomes this game for him. I don't know. That, that was my interpretation of it. Feyre storms out of the dining room and begins to paint Tamlin and Lucian with pig features. Honestly, this is a good way to deal with your anger, Feyre. Tamlin, take notes. I'll be honest. If there is anything I could see of Feyre's artwork in this entire series, it would be this, the fairy pigs, by the way, of Tamlin and Lucian. Yes. I do have a question for you, though, Lex, because there's a huge, I'll I'll call it debate, but I don't know if that's the right word, going around on the interwebs of the book talk and the bookstagram. And it's wondering if Feyre is actually a good painter or if everyone around her is just lying and she's drawing like stick figures or whatever. (laughs) I have some very specific thoughts on this, but what are your thoughts? Uh, I first and foremost think that she is a good painter. Imagine how much better she's getting at her craft in just these few weeks of nonstop painting. And when her mother was alive, we have to remember the only thing that intrigued her about Feyre was her artistic ability. So if she showed promise as a kid, that's got to count for something, right? So I think she really hones her skill throughout the series. And by the time she, you know, gifts the inner circle their paintings in, I think it's uh, Frost and Starlight, she's an incredible artist. So So I think, you know, give our girl a few more centuries and she's as good as the art gallery paintings. Mm -hmm. Especially considering SJM's other female main characters who are very talented in a specific artistic endeavor. I think it would be a a very massive disservice to Farrah's character if she's just like drawn stick figures. I think that I agree with you completely. I think she's a beautiful artist and I actually get very defensive when people are like, oh, what if she's just drawing stick figures? I'm like, give my girl some credit. I also really don't like the idea of other people, especially like the inner circle, lying to her just to make her feel better. That is not the inner circle style in the slightest. There's no way Amran, especially Amran, <laughs> wouldn't say something at some point. And then when we're in Cassian's POV, he finds her artwork absolutely breathtaking. Yes, he could think this because she's this high lady and he has rose colored glasses when it comes to her. But I don't know. I just really think she's great at what she does. And she's especially getting better from her early days here in the spring court to her eventual night court comeuppance with her artistic ability. Yeah. So later that night, after Feyre has gotten her anger out by painting little fey pigs, she meets up with Tamlin and Tamlin apologizes, which I love how this scene is just brushed over. It's just it's like almost it, we're not even in the scene. It's just like casually mentioned, which I want to know what a Tamlin apology looks like. I'm not going to lie. I would love to know because we only really see one in this series, which we'll get into in Akamath. But he gives Feyre some white roses. And yep, you guessed it. Plant Watch is back in session. White roses symbolize loyalty, purity, and innocence. But they can also symbolize eternal love, a fresh start, and a fresh beginning. Typically, the symbolism is involved with wedding flowers, which side note, my my bouquet had quite a number of white roses in it. And actually, Brett for Valentine's Day got me a bouquet of white roses because he knew how much I love my wedding bouquet. And yes, I cried. Good man. That's adorable. He's adorable. <laughs> That's adorable. <laughs> I love him. So I have a question for you, though, Nicole. Do you think that Feyre forgave Tamlin too quickly? I think that she is in the beginning of a relationship and she has the rose colored glasses on that. Yep. Yes, made her forgive him far too quickly. And she's also thinking not about the red flags that we very blatantly saw on Calamite night and the 
you know, next morning, she's instead thinking about how this incredibly masculine man who's super protective makes her feel safe. I absolutely agree with you. I think that she did forgive him, you know, in hindsight, forgave him too quickly. And I think it's a strong reflection, again, of that dynamic here in the spring court. Tamlin, he's a straight up asshat. And she quickly forgives him and excuses his behavior. I'll even go so far to say she doesn't understand or recognize the problems with his behavior because this is all she knows as she's blossomed into herself. And in Akamas, she reflects back on this, like being like, oh, like how naive I was kind of stuff. And, and that's OK, because, again, we are on this journey with her. Since we readers are in Feyre's head and following her stream of conscience, we forgive Tamlin too just as quickly and we focus on how hot that was and what stirred it up inside of her. Which, by the way, again, it's totally okay that it did stir up all that for her. You want to get bit? You go for it, girl. But there's context. Context is extremely important in this situation. The context is wildly important. (laughs) And the don't ever disobey me again is doing a lot of heavy lifting that night. And then the next day, too, when he's like, well, it's her own fault. Oh, my God. I can't even talk. Like, that is that is an unforgivable thing. Like, I remember even like, again, the first time I read this, I was a huge Tamlin stan. I even remember reading that and being like, ooh, um, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. (laughs) That was not okay. But the next night, however, Feyre finally steps into some flirting of her own. She decides to switch up her wardrobe a little bit. In lieu of her traditional tunic and pants, she is wearing a golden lace underdress with a turquoise gossamer sheer overgown. I... I want to wear this. I've never seen fan art of this, which honestly I get. There's so many more beautiful clothes in the night court, but I want to see some fan art of this. This sounds beautiful. She looks hot. Putting aside everything I've been saying for these last few scenes, (laughs) in this moment, I am really happy for Feyre. She may be nervous about wearing a dress, but it represents that she feels safe enough to try something pretty, to step out of that survival mode she's been in for so long with pants that make her feel secure and comfortable to trying something outside side of that comfort zone and leaning into that beauty. Remember why she initially didn't want to wear a dress. It would have been a liability. It would have prevented her from running and fighting. She doesn't feel like she needs to do any of those things anymore. So a dress is indeed safe for her to wear. I don't think that she's consciously thinking this by any means, but it shows just how much she's growing here and really coming into her own and feeling that protective nature that Tamlin is giving to her. Without wanting to lose her nerve, though, she strides into you'll never guess it, the dining room. And both males stop talking immediately, looking at her with wide eyes. And Lucian goes, well, I'm late for something incredibly important and vanishes. Wing man. Well done, my guy. We have given Tamlin a really hard time in this past stretch of chapters, deservedly so. But Right now, he's doing a very good job of courting a woman. I think we can both agree on that. Yes. (laughs) These two are on opposite ends of a very long table, which again shows that the differences between the spring court way of like, you know, doing very formal dinners and the night court, which Reese does not even sit at the end of the table in like that normal high lord spot. He sits amongst the family. They make Lucian. Lucian's the one who sits at the high table. That's so so funny. He's like, I don't know what the dress code is. And Feyre's like, me neither. (laughs) It's just comfy. (laughs) But Feyre says, you're so far away. And this is honestly better than your hair is clean by a long shot. But Tim and Tam's got some game here. He immediately shortens the table and says better. And then she's like, how did you do that? He's like, I have a chance to show off to a beautiful woman. This is okay, Tamlin. Stick with this. Yeah, we're back in A territory here with your report card. (laughs) We are. There's some lingering resentment, though, for you, my guy. After complimenting her beauty, Feyre remarks that some of the light has crept back into her eyes. Pause. Her eyes. Not her mother's. Not Nesta's. Hers. This is a really important scene for Feyre and her confidence. She is removing herself and her identity from being ever connected to her family and the oath that she made to her mother. Instead, she is now taking ownership over her life, over herself. I love when a story comes full circle as she steps into her own. I just love it. Feyre takes Tamlin to her painting room with all of her art. And I I love how she keeps the room locked because she knows how everyone snoops in this house. Tamlin did take her list of words she didn't know from the study after all. But I will say, Tamlin must not have tried to snoop in her painting room because he seems surprised that it's actually locked. So again, yay, Tamlin for not snooping. That's a low bar. (laughs) And 
while she has some beautiful pieces laid out as a gift for him of the Pool of Starlight, Tanlin does get curious and starts to wander. He sees her woods. He sees her cottage at night, the day her father's leg was ruined, and a painting of Isaac's hand in the hay and entwined with her hair. Her sex with Isaac painting is the only one with any brightness. I'll say the only one painted from her memory of the human lands with any brightness. And this is not, I'm not going to say sad because he was her escape, but it's very pointed about how dark her life was in the human realm. And then Tamlin's jealous of Isaac again. (laughs) Just really goes to show his very real insecurities. You know, I want Reese to meet Isaac at some point. (laughs) Can you imagine? (laughs) We're very happy for Isaac, though. He, He found love and we're very happy for him. The intended gift for Tamlin was an impression, not a lifelike rendering. And I wonder if this is because the impression painting could have been interpreted no matter what as artistic and good versus a lifelike rendering with Feyre criticizing herself for the imperfections of trying to make it lifelike. It's a really big deal for Feyre to share this room and her paintings with Tamlin. That cannot be understated here. She's obviously nervous and self-conscious about her artwork, especially knowing she's just a human. She blames the wine she had at dinner. You can see her inner walls try to start building back up instinctively, but Tamlin's softness keeps those walls from truly going back up. And while I get it, they're sharing a sweet moment of vulnerability here. Tamlin, she specifically chose a painting for you. And you're like, nah. I want that one instead. But then Feyre starts asking Tamlin about how she can help him with the blight. And he says that, quote, there's nothing I want you to do, nothing you can do or anyone. It's my burden to bear. Note that can is in italics. Interesting that he has said previously that he's never willingly lied to her. Is he kind of lying now, though? Because there is something she can do. But is the curse also making it literally impossible for him to say anything else? Yes, that's my interpretation. He also goes on to say that Feyre wouldn't survive, which would indeed be true, too. So I believe he is looking beyond the curse right now. I think he knows that if slash when she says that she loves him and therefore breaks the curse, it's only the beginning of hell with Amarantha, a whole new kind of hell. The curse breaks, yes, but she'd still be in existence and they still have to grapple with her and face her. I think that Reese even says at some point that she would have killed her no matter what, like even after she breaks the curse curse. And Tamlin knows this too. I think that's what he's worrying about here. He wants to break the curse, of course, but he also wants to protect Feyre. We'll talk a lot about this next episode when he sends her back to the mortal realm, though. So I'm, I'm going to hold off on that full talk. He wants to keep her here where he can look after her and know she's home painting and safe. But I feel like Tamlin is so torn wanting time to just to freeze and let this life they're living be eternity, knowing what is very quickly approaching both with the deadline and with the potential breaking of the curse. He doesn't want to face it. He doesn't want to face anything in the future, no matter which way it goes. I was going to say Tamlin not wanting to think a few steps ahead. What a <laughs> what a surprise. So I am going to continue parsing through Tim and Tam's words. And that is Tamlin says, quote, I've had many lovers females of noble birth, warriors, princesses. First and foremost, what a fucking flex. My guy, like you don't need to say this to a woman you're courting. Like just exes are off the table. Just don't say that. Who are Tamlin's exes, Lexi? What are your theories? I have an un... I have an unhinged theory about one ex in particular, because yes, when he says lovers of noble birth and warriors, he could be talking about a number of women, specifically other high fae. But that last brag, yes, I'm calling it a brag, is princesses. Hold up, everyone. Princesses is not a common title for these high fae. Yes, some are casually referenced as princesses, like Feyre certainly is, and more a few times too, but not in a we address you as a princess kind of way. There are only two characters that we meet in the series who go by their princess titles. Princess Branna, one of the Highburn twins who comes to the spring court in Akawar, and Criseida, princess of Adriata in the summer court. 
yes, there may be other princesses. I don't know how or why someone is determined as a princess while others aren't, but we're not talking about that right now. Let's focus on these two princesses. Princess Branna is from Highburn, and we know Tamlin's dad was close with Highburn, so he could have had an affair with her through the years of the alliance. But I'm going to be honest, I believe she and her twin brother, Prince Dagden, had a Lannister thing going, if you know what I mean. And when they're in the spring court, we get absolutely no hint of a prior affair between her and Tamlin. So we're going to cross her off, which leaves Criseida. I have a theory that she and Tamlin used to be a thing. And here's why. First of all, Tarquin may be the youngest High Lord by several centuries, but we know that she is the oldest sister of his cousin. So we don't have an exact age, but I do think that it's fair to believe she is closer to Tamlin's age, or at least not nearly as young as Tarquin. So the timeline of a possible tumble in the sheets is there. Okay, number two, she lives in Summer Court, which shares a border with the Spring Court and having territory so close to each other, there is, I don't know if I call it a formal alliance, but there is a friendly-ish relations between these two warm seasonal courts that border one another. And lastly, number three, when we meet Crusada in Akamath, she is the one who starts stirring the pot about Tamlin. And she's the one who's got a bit of a bite towards Feyre about it, almost like an ex-lover of his. I, like if you really like reread like the whole scene where she is really not being nice to Feyre about how the whole thing went with Tamlin went down and she's kind of threatening that she's going to go talk to Tamlin. I don't know. Like I'm rereading that now with these new eyes and it's like, wait a second. Maybe, again, unhinged theory, but I'm just throwing it out there that Crusada could be at least one of the princesses Tamlin's been with. Honestly, though, I think he would make princess be plural just to make himself sound like he's been with multiple princesses, but it was really just one. I have been slowly falling deep into this Tamlin and Reese's sister rabbit hole, but you texted me this and I was like, abandon ship, abandon ship. I'm on board. I'm on board. I <laughs> love this so much. He does also say here, none of his previous lovers knew what it was like for him and his struggles. He had a very like, they didn't understand me moment. And I do think that if he already had a mate, they would have been very attuned to this this. Are you saying you're officially closing the door to this theory of Reese's sister and Tamlin being mates, Nicole? I'm not officially closing the door. However, I'm more okay with the door being closed because the Crusada door just swung wide open. Yeah. <laughs> we do have to talk about the last sentence of this chapter, though, which is from Feyre. She says in her inner monologue, I didn't lock my bedroom door that night. Our girl, and not even rigging up a system, she didn't even lock her door. Our girl's ready. Neither of them feel alone anymore. They found each other through their sorrows and they found happiness together. That is not what I got from that <laughs> sentence, but okay. No, I know what it really meant. I was trying to give extra context. <laughs> now with all of this exes talk, I really hope that Tamlin went to some therapy over them. And in fact, yesterday I was in therapy and my therapist, who is also a big lover of the Sarah J. Mass first and the, and the fantasy books, she mentions starting up a meditation practice. And you know what I told her about Lexi? I've got to guess. I've got to guess. I told her about <laughs> Amelie. Amelie is a new role-playing meditation podcast that takes you into a world of magic and fantasy. You'll be invited to imagine yourself in scenarios such as learning how to cast a tranquility spell or exploring a land once vanquished by a dragon. But it's all connected by a shared mythology. I'm so glad you're loving this new podcast too because you know how obsessed I've been. Like every, everybody who talks to me knows how obsessed I've been. <laughs> Anomaly combines traits of a great storyteller with those of a talent meditation guide, weaving tales of fantasy that stretch the imagination while you learn to center yourself, offer forgiveness, find confidence, and relieve stress. In the eight chapters, three of which are out as of this recording, you will imagine yourself in a different world, hear a story unfold, and along the way learn potions, chants, and enchantments that will help you both in that reality and your own. Look for Anomaly on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to podcasts. It's Anomaly spelled with an I-E at the end not a Y. Go to Seek Anomaly, S-E-E-K-A-N-O-M-A-L-I-E dot -E com. That's SeekAnomaly.com to find out more. We finally enter the dating stretch for Tamlin and Feyre. Tamlin does start to get a little charming. We do have that Prince Charming element added to him. Like he didn't need to kiss her eyes in order for the glamour to work for her, but he did. And to be honest, it was smooth. It was a smooth move, my guy. 
But I love, I love how Pharaoh's experience of seeing things as the high fae do is described. The bird singing is like an orchestra. The willow is singing this melancholy song. The world is rich in color and the leaves are radiant. Like it's so descriptive. It's such masterful writing from SJM. And then there's Tamlin who's emulating power, who is devastatingly handsome and captivating and oh, so powerful. You know, we should have done a count for the phrase devastatingly handsome or beautiful. It's used so much. (laughs) We decided to count watery vowels instead. (laughs) If you are someone, though, who's ever gotten glasses or contacts for the first time after going a long time without having them, this might feel like a bit of a familiar experience. The first time I got glasses, Lexi, I was going to the Costco optometrist. And if you've never been in a Costco, it's this giant warehouse where like the beams on the ceilings, there's, it's very, I won't say intricate by any means, but it's definitely large and in charge. I went to this Costco eye doctor. I got my you know eyes checked. I got my contacts. I put them in and I walk outside and not outside, outside. I'm talking outside into the warehouse. And I look up at the ceiling and I'm just like, oh oh my God, like this, it's so clear. Everything's so bright and crisp. And I'm just like, I feel like this is as close to this moment with Feyre and Tamlin as I've ever experienced. I do want to note too, how much the mask bothers Feyre. It's not because she's vain. It's what the mask represents. Not a leash, but it is a symbol of the control Tamlin and his court are under. And she doesn't appreciate that for her high lord. Or hey, maybe she is actually a little bit vain. Maybe Amarantha is kind of right because the reason she put the masks on Tamlin and his court in the first place are because it would make it more difficult for a human to fall in love with him because all they care about are looks. And this is a little nod to that, but I don't actually think that's it. I think that it's definitely more of what the mask symbolizes. I bet Tamlin was so excited for this kiss. At this point in their relationship, I could see him being like, okay, maybe today's the day and plans out their beautiful out what he's going to do to charm her. And then she still doesn't say she loves him. So he's like, ah, drat, maybe tomorrow. But then at the same time, he doesn't want her to break the curse because he knows it's only the beginning of the next wrath of Amarantha, like I said earlier. And he's all confused with himself anyway. But here he's like, okay, she agreed to kiss me and he's all excited. And then she gives him a smack on the back of his hand and falls asleep. (laughs) I feel like we've all been there in some way, shape or form. (laughs) I do wonder though, why does she get so sleepy? Like that just kind of felt out of nowhere. I've been wondering this too. I searched on Reddit. I searched Tumblr. I searched Google. I searched TikTok. And maybe the answer are some theories. They they very well might be out there. I'm sure that they already is. Akatar, there's a theory for everything, but I sure didn't find any. (laughs) So I'm going with this answer magic. (laughs) But really, I think this is a beautiful representation of how the magic grows and is part of the land and life here in the spring court. Why wasn't this our answer for the pool of starlight scene? Because if the internet has theories, we get excited and share them. That's why. These lands have seen so much and they have a life of their own, not in a weird way, but in a everything around us is alive kind of way. How that makes her fall asleep? I think it actually comes back to Tamlin heightening her senses and giving her a glimpse of what Faye experienced. Her human body becomes so exhausted, like a peaceful exhaustion, but still exhausted from feeling all the high Faye senses. So that combined with this magic in the air, the willow lulls her to sleep and she feels safe and warm here. Can you imagine her letting this happen earlier in the book? Like it wouldn't have happened. So it represents her feelings of security with Tamlin and the spring court. But then she wakes up. And she sees all sorts of new things. Specifically, Alice is not what she normally looks like, at least to Feyre. Did Alice not know that Tamlin was glamoring Feyre to be able to not see her true form? Like, the other fairies seem surprised suddenly to notice that she's looking at them. So they seem to know. But was Alice not in that onboarding (laughs) meeting? Onboarding in the spring court really needs some work. I mean, it checks out. I think most companies could use some work with their onboarding processes, too. It's not just a spring court. That is all we'll say about that. (laughs) Also, she would have tried 10 times harder to get the fuck out of there. She needed some time to get adjusted to this new world so that she could have, I'll I'll pull it, I'll call it a calm reaction. I feel like she has a pretty calm reaction to this. She's startled, but not scared. Yeah. I think is the best way of putting it. Maybe just tell her what's about to happen. Like, again, she did fall asleep, so maybe he didn't have the opportunity to. And then the next paragraph, SJM writes... The next day, I found a head in the garden. (laughs) So 
this escalated quickly. This is a tough look from the night court. However, we all like, uh, we'll be saying that a lot. This is a tough look from Reese. This is a tough look from the night court. However, we will learn later that this is one of the things that Amarantha horrifically forced Reese to do. I do wonder what Haifei, who the Haifei was, because she does say it looks human. So he is a Haifei guy, hum person. But who was it, I wonder? I don't know. All we know is it's not someone from the autumn court, and it's definitely not somebody from the spring court. And that's all we know. Sucks to be that guy. I know. We know that Reese does not know at this time that the human girl he saw at Calamai and who he has that connection with is there with Tamlin. He knows that she's in Perithian, but not that she's staying in the Spring Court Manor. So this head in the Spring Court has no correlation to Farah's presence there. We do, however, in the scene, get the sigil for the Night Court. It is a mountain with three stars that we will later learn that Reese has tattooed on both of his knees, symbolizing that he will bow before no one and nothing nothing but his crown and soon his mate. Lucian gives some insight on what the night court is like, and it's not pretty, friends. The sadistic killers who delight in torture, they live by their own codes and corrupt morals and find heads on spikes to be amusing. This is what the court of nightmares is like, but we will soon learn that the court of dreams is, uh, I won't say the opposite, but they're not maybe as sadistic as uh Oh, Lucian I'd say the opposite. Well, I'd definitely say the opposite. I'd say that Cassian and Azrael both, <laughs> they've got some darkness to them. So does I mean, let's not forget Amran is literally a monster. <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see where you're coming with this. And, and yes, corrupt morals. Hello, Morley Gray. <laughs> say he's Morley Gray. <laughs> song's such a banger. I love it. Now, the last thing to close out this cauldron part of the episode is, you betcha, a claw watch. Tamlin tells Feyre about the slaves leaving the spring court and how they were happy to be leaving. His claws start to poke out when he's discussing his father being unhappy to see them go. It does make me wonder what this stretch of time was like for Tamlin. It did make him adamantly decide that he was never going to keep slaves, which does make how he treats Feyre next book rather interesting. But we will analyze that fully when we start Akamath. I, I will say she becomes his prized possession, not his slave. And no way slave. I definitely, yeah. it's no way slave. But she does say to him, you've never made me feel like a prisoner, Tamlin, in this particular conversation. So I do think that for Feyre, slave and prisoner, not in any way interchangeable, but they're under the same umbrella for her. I, I see what you mean there. Yeah. Yep, yep. I do wonder if the claws poking out here was a result of Reese, who, with the help of Reese's father, killed Tamlin's entire family by sneaking into the Spring Court Manor. He could have been very triggered by this head in the garden because it was 70 feet away from the spring court manor like he was so close and now there's someone who's living in this manor who he cares about very very deeply so i also think that the claws starting to poke out it was a little bit of those past shadows starting to trigger now while we already highlighted some foreshadowing moments of course let's turn our full attention onto foreshadowing to the rest of this book and other important moments in the series Tamlin mentions how he does not particularly enjoy losing. Boy, oh boy, isn't that true, Tamlin? See how you act in the High Lord's meeting in Akawar when you've officially lost Feyre. Tamlin tells Feyre that there will be answers for everything soon, but not until the time is right and it's safe. It's like he can feel the break of the curse coming, but actually it'll be Alice who offers up the answers. And then once Amarantha is killed and they all return to the Spring Court, Tamlin still guards her and doesn't give her answers claiming that it's still not safe. It'll never be safe from Tamlin's perspective. Not for Feyre, who he's desperate to protect and shield and keep hidden away from any harm. Tamlin talks about how fighting and killing are about the only things he's good at. But also, I can play a mean fiddle. We will see those fiddle talents soon enough, High Lord. Feyre doesn't have the nerve to ask if fairies have ever had mating bonds with humans. In just a few chapters of this curiosity of hers, she feels her mating bond with the High Lord of the Night Court, but obviously doesn't know what it is yet. Plus, both of her sisters also end up mated with fairies, notably not High Fey, but fairies, because Cassian, my beloved Cassian who bonds with Nesta, is Illyrian, not High Fey. Now, of course, Lucian is High 
MFA, but both of them are not. The adder mentions how she wasn't happy to learn about Tamlin sending his sentries across the border, but the adder and Amarantha believe that nothing has come of it. They will soon learn quite the opposite when Feyre charges in under the mountain. And honestly, I'm quite shocked no one in the spring court snitched. I feel like Amarantha would do some kind of twisted deal of like, if you tell me that da, 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 I'll break the curse for you and no one else. So I'm kind of surprised no one did. I am too. I definitely am too. Lucian mentions to the Adder to stay out of the cave that he used to travel to the spring court. Ah, yes, the super convenient, easy cave. We will soon see Feyre travel through said cave to do the super fast travel under the mountain. In the same scene with the Adder, he mentions how Tamlin has a heart of stone, yet another heart of stone mention, priming us for the big reveal at the end of the third task. And Feyre wonders if this she is the one who killed Tamlin's parents. But alas, nope, that was your future father-in-law. Plus, we also get another high lady mention here. So many. As Vera is describing Resand, she notices that he is not wearing a mask, so he must be from another court then. Yes, quite obviously, Vera darling. He is not only a member of another court, but he is a high lord at that. I also love that he is the first high fae without a mask that she sees. Yes, she saw other fairies without masks and other high fae who were cast in shadows because of the glamour on Kalamai, but he is the first real high fae she can fully see without a mask. Speaking of which, just everything from the Reese scene. We already went through that beat by beat, but of course I had to throw it in here. Just all of that foreshadowing there is delicious. Delicious. Tamlin's body is painted for calumni and quote, from the smudges in the paint, I knew exactly where he had been touched. Another High Lord will use the same tactic later on in this book when he has Nuala and Caridwin paint Feyre, but... He uses it to show his innocence because the paint will never be smudged in places where Tamlin would want to murder him, except for one scene. But that's Tamlin's fault for smudging the paint. We'll get to that later. (laughs) When Alice is doing Feyre's hair, she begins telling Feyre about hailing from the summer court, but she begins coughing as if choking on her words. Yes, because she is under the Amarantha curse and there are certain things she is forbidden from saying. Wait, really? I thought she was just coughing because it's a hard thing for her to talk about in general. No, it's like the curse is literally stopping her vocal cords, so she just starts coughing instead. Oh my gosh, interesting. Tamlin's magic seems a little drained after the small act of magically making the table smaller and then casting light in her painting room. Feyre thinks that if High Lords are power, something must be truly thoroughly wrong if this was all he could manage. Well, yes indeed. Amarantha took most of their power. I do love that Tamlin's like, I can light a candle. And Reese is like, I'll put my hands in my pockets and destroy your mind. (laughs) Like, God, I love him. (laughs) When Tamlin tells Feyre the blight is acting up again, she doesn't bother to offer aid, but she does wish that he would let her in and let her help. The inability to let her in is one of the many, many things that will drive a wedge between them and eventually end their relationship. And the way that she thinks how she, quote, wished he would let her in anyway, pretty much summarizes their relationship to begin with. Yeah. (laughs) Just to begin with, like full stop. Like that is a relationship right there that she wishes he would let her in. Last one here to close out our foreshadowing segment. Tamlin says about the High Lord of the Night Court that attacking Thera here in the Spring Court would be more trouble than it's worth for him. That is indeed true. He has more go to get Thera when it is not part of the bargain because otherwise all hell would have been unleashed. Although that still kind of does happen. 100%. (laughs) Now, it is time to sip some tea with a cereal, where every episode, Lexi is going to sit down with the cereal for tea time and walk us through a world-building topic to help us better understand the world and the people in it. What is today's cereal tea time, Lexi? Today is all about the Spring Court and the history of Tamlin's family. As we know, the Spring Court is one of the seven courts in Perithian and one of the four seasonal courts. It is also the southernmost court and borders the wall between Prithian and the mortal lands. To the north, the spring court borders both the summer court in the west and the autumn court in the east. Remember last episode's surreal segment. Its insignia is a blooming rose and its high lord is Tamlin. We're going to discuss his family and how he became high lord in a minute, but it's important to note the surreal describes the high lords as power itself. They are especially gifted and powerful high fae. Tamlin, for instance, has the magical abilities of great strength and shape shifting to change his form 
transform into a beast, the appearance of others, and can shapeshift others. Can he turn into any animal? I'd imagine so, but I don't think it's confirmed. Five crowns are passed down from the High Lords of the Spring Court. Tamlin chooses to wear a golden crown molded into a wreath of spring's first flowers crafted with emeralds, sapphires, and amethyst. How lovely. All right, now let's talk about the lands of the Spring Court. You'll find rolling green hills, lush forests, and clear bottomless lakes. Magic is described as growing here. There are countless meadows, a pool of starlight, singing willows, bountiful flowers, and fauna everywhere. Think of the botanical gardens times 10 with an extra dose of magic. Now, when it comes to the Spring Court population, there is not much to highlight because we don't know a lot. While there's no cities, there is at least one large village less than five miles away from Tamlin's Manor. And we know there are other groups, villages, and clans spread throughout the court based on the good number of emissaries who show up for the tithe. This court territory is vast, and it's my speculation it would take about three days to get from one end to the other. Feyre, however, is sheltered from outside the manor. So because we're in her POV, we don't know much else about the inhabitants or towns of the Spring Court. The manor is itself is a sprawling estate. Think roses and ivy climbing up it and blooming flowers everywhere. It has a grand marble staircase leading up to the giant oak doors. You've got your black and white checkered marble floors. You've got your sweeping staircases and faces overflowing with hydrania. The fan art for the spring court is just absolutely incredible. The spring court holds what is called the tithe twice a year, usually around the summer and winter solstices. It's where every member of the spring court, from high fae to the lesser fairies, have have to pay a tithe dependent on their income and status. In exchange, Tamlin protects them, rules them, helps them when he can. Think taxes here, folks. If you don't show up or aren't able to pay within the three-day grace period or double next time, High Lord Tamlin will hunt you down and kill you is my understanding of it. We also have to talk about the holidays in the spring court, taking a hard left turn here. We have Kalamai, of course, also known as Fire Night, when the Great Rite takes place. We discussed this at length already this episode, so the quick version is that in order to regenerate magic back into the land, the High Lord of the spring court receives a whole lot of magic, and he becomes the hunter. He performs the Great Rite, aka the Bang, with the selected maiden, and then all of the members of the court bang to produce magic together. I, I can't say that with a straight face. There is also Ninsar, the day of seeds and flowers. It's a minor spring holiday to celebrate the end of seeding the fields and to pass out the first flower clippings of the season. It's around the spring equinox between the winter solstice and Kalamai. We also, of course, have summer solstice, which we will get to next episode. It sounds like an absolute delight with gardens decorated with ribbons and streamers and the wine is fantastic. It's one big summer party with music and dancing and will the wisp so oh my. When Nianthi arrives, there will be a ceremony that takes place two hours before dawn because the high priestess brings the religion to the party. And lastly, winter solstice is celebrated. Even though the spring court is not where it's the biggest holiday, it's still three days of feasting and gift exchanges with several religious ceremonies, one at sunset and one at dawn. All right, friends, now it's time for part two of the surreal segment, which is going to be about the history of Tamlin's family and how he became high lord. Before Tamlin ruled the spring court, his father was high lord, and he was a terrible, vicious high lord who happily kept humans enslaved and did terrible things to them. His father and mother were mates. In fact, the rose garden at the manor was planted for her as a mating present. The two of them had three sons, and while not outright stated, I think we can infer Tamlin was the youngest, because he had no expectation of being in politics and always assumed his brothers would lead. And these brothers, the other two sons of the High Lord of the Spring Court, were just as awful as their father. Tamlin's father was a strong ally with the King of Highburn during the war. He was close with the King and his commanders, specifically Amarantha, and Tamlin was often required to accompany his father on trips to Highburn. So during the war, of course, the Spring Court allied with Highburn. After the war, however, and once Tamlin grew up, Amarantha started getting googly eyes at him, but Tamlin was on to who she really was, and he did not desire her back. Their history, however, is for another day. So Tamlin joined his father's war band, played the fiddle, wrote poetry, had many lovers who were of nobility and warriors, and let's not forget princesses, even though he had no intention of being High Lord, he was, I'll say, manifesting his power like he was the chosen one. That's another discussion for another day, too. Tamlin befriended the son of the High Lord of the Night Court, Resand. Sometime later, Tamlin's father took his three sons to kill Resand's mother and sister. As retribution for his mate and daughter's death, the High Lord of the Night Court, along with his son Resand, murdered Tamlin's mother, his two brothers, and then Reese's father killed Tamlin's father. The powers shifted to Tamlin, 
and Resand because Tamlin killed Reese's dad when he attempted to kill Tamlin. When the title fell to Tamlin, it was a rough transition for the Spring Court. Being so different than his father and unprepared for high lordship, Tamlin's father's courtiers defected to other courts rather than have, quote, a warrior beast snarling at them. And that, my friends, is the bloody history of the High Lords of the Spring Court. That does make a lot of sense for a lot of things in Tamlin's character now. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. He's had a rough time, folks. Like, he really has. <laughs> <laughs> and now it is time to close out this episode. Remember, no Mass First Madness today with our favorite moments. Here I am with Farah's artistic mind again. I love how we explore the art gallery from Farah's eyes with descriptions like, quote, some had been painted through eyes like mine, artists who saw in colors and shapes I understood. And then she feels the emotions captured in these paintings, how she understands them as both a viewer and fellow artist. We might not all be artists, but we can relate to that feeling of appreciating others' skilled work in our craft. This might be a Tamlin line, but it is actually one of my favorites of the series. Quote, don't feel bad for one moment about doing what brings you joy. That's some wisdom right there. I can't help but chuckle at Farah's major FOMO with Kalamai. She's all pissy when she's there and everyone is waiting for something to happen. And she's like, I've been banned from this, having no idea that the thing they've all been waiting for is literally an orgy to kick off. I am all for your independence, Farah, darling, but you don't have to be involved in all of the fairy things. <laughs> she's a curious creature. I mean, I'd be remiss if I did not say this in favorite moments. Every single morsel of the Resand scene. No, I can't even call it a scene. Four pages, maybe. <laughs> Knowing what it means with the chapter 54 knowledge. It is masterful story plotting from Sarah J. Mass. And last but not least, when Pharaoh wakes up and realizes it's two in the morning and thinks, quote, well, he's certainly taken his time with the ritual, which meant the girl was probably beautiful and charming and appealed to his instincts. I love jealous petty Feyre and I cannot wait to see her on full display in the summer court. <laughs> That's it folks. We did Kalamai. Next episode we will be covering chapters 25 through 28 and wow can you believe as of right now we are halfway through our Akatar deep dive. We're only halfway. I thought there was more. <laughs> I can't like the second half of this book. I cannot wait to go into. I'm so excited. Thank you as always to our executive producer, Hayden, AKA our sanity manager. We do not know what we would do without you, particularly in this past month. Honestly, I feel like we say that every episode, but really, thank you for all you do. And if you want more content, join the Patreon party. Or if you want a free version of more content, sign up for our newsletter. You can also follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Fantasy Fangirls Pod. Do not forget also to rate and review the show. Side note, this is one of the best things that you can do for any podcast that you listen to, not just the Fantasy Fangirls, any podcast that you listen to, please take a moment to rate and review. It is so helpful with getting the word out there on that sweet, sweet podcasting algorithm. If you're watching on YouTube, however, take a moment to like and subscribe to the channel so you never miss an episode. Also, don't forget to share with your fellow Akatar friends. If you, too, had a very very confusing sexual awakening on Calamai. This is a great episode to share with them and then really wonder why you are the way that you are. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We love you all so much. We will see you next week and we will talk to you soon. Bye. Yeets. Ye why did I say it like that? That was so aggressive. Bit. Hold on. We got further. Nussle. Nussles. So many warning bail. Morning bales. <laughs> oh my god, good luck editing this episode. It's just a <laughs> Oh, I'm leaving that in. Blah. Plummeted back down to that zero, if not negative zero. Negative zero is not a number, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to this cop Costco optometrist. Optometrist. <laughs>